it's wonderful to be back to Montana State University. Uh, and I'm Candy. This is Sam. Hello. And uh, we're going to be teaching a course uh, on Broadway. Broadway Deconstructed. And let me tell you a little bit about Sam and myself. We are obsessed with musicals, absolutely obsessed. We met in a musical mm-hmm. and we have acted together. We've co-directed. We've taught theater courses. Um, and I'm especially excited about this lecture. What's it about, Sam? It's called Broadway Deconstructed. And what we do is we divide the Broadway play into five different categories. The opening number, the leading character's number, the supporting character's number. This is my favorite part because the supporting character gets to sing the bawdiest and the funniest songs, the blockbuster, and the 10 o'clock number. And when you put all these five elements together, you get a Broadway musical. That's right. And what we do, the way we teach it is and lecture on it is we talk a little bit, we show a clip, then we talk about the clip, talk a little more, uh, show another clip, and then we always leave time at the end for questions. Because as as I said before, we are obsessed with musicals. So uh, you know, we sometimes we agree, most of the times we agree, <laughs> but sometimes we disagree. My favorite is not the featured character song category. Mm-hmm. I like the opening number. Opening mm-hmm. number, sometimes you watch an opening number, and right away you know if you're going to love that musical or not love the musical. Of course, sometimes that doesn't happen, but usually it does. And we're going to show some familiar scenes, some big hit scenes, but we're also going to show some scenes that maybe you're not that familiar with, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, it's always interesting to, to see things from flops or to see things from you haven't seen big success or, or, yeah. yeah. So I hope we see you there. It's sometime in November, uh, Broadway deconstructed. Hope you join us. And it's cheaper than a ticket to Broadway. That's for sure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Ann Ellsworth, and I'm delighted to take a few minutes of your time to tell you about a short course I am offering titled, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Grammar Fundamentals for Everyone. Why this topic? Why grammar? Well, often when you mention the G word, people roll their eyes or cringe or recall horrible, horrible memories and school experiences. And I would like to revisit this topic and put a positive spin on it because I contend that grammar learning and grammar doing can be loads of fun. So what are my credentials? What enables me to talk about this taboo subject? I'm a former public school teacher. I was an English teacher, a classroom teacher in the K-8 grades, and also a reading specialist. Now I teach at MSU, and I teach courses on literacy, linguistics, uh, writing, and of course, grammar. In fact, I've designed the only grammar class in higher education that's offered on our campus. So I'm pretty proud of that. What's going to happen in this course? Well, the two-hour sessions are going to be full of hands-on active learning activities. And I use this approach. I will do it first, then we'll do it together. And then you have an opportunity to do it and practice it. Most importantly, your questions will be answered. So if you have any questions, bring those and we will address those right off the bat. But a general organizational structure for this class is that we will talk about the eight parts of speech. Did you know that every word in the English language can be classified into one of these eight categories? Yes, indeed. We'll also talk about frequently confused words such as effect versus affect. And if you know grammar, you never get those confused. We'll also talk about some um, grammar labels like phrases and clauses, independent clauses, dependent clauses, subordinate clauses. What do all those words mean? They really are quite simple. Just the labels are confusing. And we'll talk about sentence diagramming. In the grammar course I teach on campus, I do diagramming. So we'll either take a a moderate dive into this topic or we'll bypass it completely, or we can go deeper, all depending on what you're interested in. So thank you for viewing this short introduction. And I hope that uh, my preview here is intriguing and that you will join me for what I promise to be a most valuable course. 
Thank you. Hi, welcome to Water Resources. I'm out standing in my field. Ha, it's a joke, right? But I'm out standing in some hawthorn and some uh, cow parsnip and what we're looking for wetlands here in Idaho right now. And in this class, we're gonna talk about wetlands. We're gonna talk about streams. We're gonna talk about how humans use water, how we transport water around, how we deal with wastewater, how we deal with drinking water. We're gonna cover a lot of stuff. We're gonna have some time in the classroom and some time in the field. It's gonna be amazing. I look forward to seeing you in class. Thanks. Hi, my name is Bob Loftus, and I'm a retired Foreign Service officer and former ambassador to the Kingdom of Lesotho. This fall, I'll be teaching a course on U.S. relations with Sub-Saharan Africa. What we'd like to do during this course is look at why Africa matters to the United States and why the United States matters to Africa, trying to dispel some of the stereotypes and getting bypassed some of the simplistic views of our relationship with what is one of the fastest growing areas of the world. We'll start with a little bit of history because you can't understand where you are without knowing where you've been. And then we'll look at how the U.S. engages with Africa on a diplomatic level, economically and through aid, and on security issues, particularly like things like, like AFRICOM, the U.S. Africa Command. Um, even though Africa is quite a number of countries, we kind of focus on, on several key ones. So we'll look at those relationships, particularly South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And then we'll end with a, a discussion on how to actually formulate a, a better strategy for dealing with uh, our relationship with Africa. Um, I will bring my experience at our embassies in Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, and Lesotho, plus time spent in Washington on African issues. I hope you will bring any of your own experiences, and I look forward to lively discussions and a very interesting course. I hope you'll join me there. Hi there, I'm Beth Madden, and I'm going to be teaching an in-person Ollie course this fall called Grasping Grasslands, a Prairie Primer. I'm a retired wildlife biologist, and I spent the bulk of my career working in the prairies of North Dakota and eastern Montana, mostly for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I have a master's degree from Montana State University and my specialty was research on prairie birds and their habitat. Personally, I knew very little about grasslands before I started my research, and I find that's really common. Most of us know next to nothing about them or how important they really are. So this course is designed to change all that, and we'll have a lot to cover. We'll start out by taking a look at the history geography, and culture of the prairies. And when I say history, I mean we'll be considering the ecosystem before European settlement as well as since. And then we're going to dive into prairie ecology. We'll study the adaptations of all the plants and animals that live there, as well as the ecosystem services that prairies provide. I also want to be sure students are aware of the magnitude of prairie loss, as well as current conservation efforts. So we'll examine why and how Montana is such a stronghold for so many prairie conservation initiatives. In the end, I'll leave students with some tips for visiting the prairies on their own to learn more. Our format is going to be mostly PowerPoint lectures with maybe a few short videos, but we'll also have some interactive fun like trivia challenges. So if you can, please join me to learn more about the fascinating ecosystem that makes up more than two thirds of Montana. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Bruce McNabb, inviting you to embark with me on a journey back in time with a new course, Illuminating the Dark Ages, starting on September 27th. It's a sequel to my 2020 offering, What Can We Learn from the Fall of Rome? The years between 500 and 1000 were once labeled the Dark Ages, a time of cultural decline, technological poverty, and social misery. I hope to demonstrate that this age was not dark, but that people are often in the dark about it. Those centuries of transformation as centralized Roman rule in Europe yielded to compact successor states with different polities resulted in cultural, political, economic, and military shifts that laid the foundation of modern Europe. In four sessions, we will navigate the intricate paths that this transformation took and take a look at the rise of Charlemagne's empire, his palace is portrayed behind me, Anglo-Saxon England, and the multicultural state that was known as the Emirate of Cordova. We'll demystify feudalism and learn how it evolved. The course will delve into the crucial role of the Catholic Church in maintaining Roman cultural continuity. And we'll also examine changing patterns of trade, as well as the shift from urban to dispersed power centers. We'll rethink the so-called era of great migrations and discuss how serfdom related to slavery and free peasant farmers related to large estates. Moreover, we'll look at ways Western European culture evolved in this period from education to fine arts and architecture. Together, I hope that we will illuminate these dark ages and see a colorful tapestry revealed. The study of history helps us live better lives today. So whether you're a seasoned early history enthusiast or new to the field, I hope that this course will offer fresh insights and spark some lively discussion. I look forward to welcoming you on September 27th. Hi everyone at Ollie. My name is Jess Payne. I'm very excited to be joining you this fall to teach Tudor England. I am, brief intro about me, I am a Montana native, fifth generation. I grew up in Livingston and I've had a fascination with British history since middle school. I completed my BA in history at Montana State in 2010. I then made my way to London, England, King's College, where I received my MA in European history in 2011. And then I ended up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at LSU in <clears throat> to, um, to start and finish my PhD, which I did in 2021. And um, my dissertation focused on the court culture of Charles I within an Elizabethan lens and perspective. I love Tudor history. And the best way that I can teach this to you, and I, and I want to, is to give you a much more broader picture of that very important dialogue between king and queen and people. Um, for 1500 years, monarchy has governed England, and it is the oldest political, politic, political functioning institution in Europe. Um, and it is so much more, so much more complicated and intractable and interesting than what is portrayed in melodramatic TV series and, and books. Philippa Gregory comes to mind. Um, you know, the, the, this portrays a very dysfunctional, sexified royal family, which great fun. But the truth, again, is so much more lively and complicated and worth looking at. So to do so, I need to challenge and inspire you to participate in the historical discipline, um, as I've been doing most of my life, that teaches us to want to understand and um, empathize and think critically about people and places long, long ago, but not so far removed from us as we might think. Um, as such, I want to start by looking at a little bit of medieval background, the War of the Roses, that fight between the Yorkists and the Lancastrians, how that established the Tudor dynasty. But also keep in mind, there was no such thing as Tudor England 
until long after the last Tudor was dead. Um, Henry VII and his children um, very much sought refuge in the memory of their medieval predecessors. They didn't see themselves as establishing this new and distinctive dynasty. So we need to depart from these notions that Tudor England was ushering in religious awakening, beginning of empire in the modern bureaucratic state. So what what really is important about Tudor England? That's what we're gonna we're gonna dive into. Very excited, but for now, enjoy summer. Um, it finally got to us. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. David Smith from Seattle, Washington. I have the privilege of doing adult education in the humanities full time, particularly philosophy and comparative religion. I have the opportunity and the privilege to teach my social and criminal justice course for Montana State OLLI program this fall, and I hope you'll consider taking the series. I bring both academics and experience as a former city police officer to this series social and criminal justice. We will look at theories of justice. We'll look at the affirmative action and reparations debate. We'll look at controversies over policing. We'll look at the capital punishment debate and other things as well. And the goal is to think about both social and criminal justice and to try to integrate our thoughts about each of those with the other. I have a passion for criminal justice reform in particular, especially exonerating the innocent. We need to talk about why innocent people in the United States are being convicted and sentenced. So hope you'll join us again, social and criminal justice. My mission as an educator in the humanities is not to tell you what to believe, but to empower people to think for themselves well about things that matter. My motto is respectfully bold. We can be both respectful and bold and we'll try to do that. October and November, Thursday afternoons this fall, hope you'll join us. Hello, my name is Michael Smith. I will be offering the everyday timeless poetry of the Tang Dynasty for Ali this autumn. The Tang poets were city dwellers and rural farmers, wanderers and hermits. Steeped in Taoism and Buddhism and keen observers of nature, they held a special regard for the cyclical nature of things. For example, here is a poem by Fai Yun, a daughter of the Tang royal family who chose to become a Buddhist nun. This body, without a self, can be compared to floating duckweed. This body, with its troubles, is exactly like a leaf in the wind. This cycle of life and death is just like that of night and day. Here in this poem is the Tao, the Tao that can't be spoken, the divine process of creation and regeneration that continually recreates the cosmos. The Tang poets were also adept chroniclers of war, culture, and history. Many were exiled by the court because of their views and suffered in uncountable ways. Here is Night Thoughts by Li Po, perhaps the most famous poem in the Tang catalog by arguably its most famous poet. Moon before the bed or frost on the ground. Lifting my head, I see the moon. Looking down, I remember home. Here in this poem is the Buddhist practice of being present to presence and loss. Now, 1300 years later, the Tang poets speak to us. It's my hope that their feelings and insights resonate with the participants of this program as much as they have with me. I look forward to our journey to Tang China together. Thank you. Hi everybody. 
My name is Derek Strawn, and I am super excited to be introducing a new course for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Montana State University. The class is entitled An American Portrait Part Two. It's a survey of American history from the Gilded Age, which is basically the late 1800s, right up to the present day. Um, this is definitely my most favorite period of American history to talk about and to uh, explore with students. And I'm hoping that you'll consider joining me for this historical adventure. Um, the class will meet starting in October for um, six two-hour sessions once a week. Uh, each class will involve uh, a hopefully engaging slideshow and discussion, uh, question and answer period. I will also try to pull together for you some interesting primary sources that will zero in on the people and the events that we're studying for that particular week. So please consider joining me for uh, an American Portrait Part 2. Uh, I would love to have you in class. If you took the springtime uh, part one session, um, I would welcome you back. I thought we had a great experience in the spring and it would be wonderful to see you all again. But even if you didn't take the class, I think there's a lot that could be gained from considering the second half, um, the more recent decades um, leading up to the present day in American history. So consider signing up for An American Portrait Part 2. Uh, I look forward to talking to you in the fall and let's learn some American American history. Take care, everybody. Have a great summer. Bye. Hi there, everyone. My name is Oakley Wurzweiler, and I'm here to chat with you about the CPR course hosted by MSU through the American Heart Association. Um, I am a full-time MSU employee. I work in the outdoor recreation program and I teach all of the wilderness medicine courses here. So I teach wilderness medicine as well as CPR and first aid. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a certified EMT and a wilderness first responder. And so my main passion is teaching folks um, how to be prepared in the backcountry, as well as what to do if some sort of medical scenario does happen when they're in a backcountry setting or in an urban setting. I really like knowing that more people are uh, out and about recreating with this skill set and able to help other people if they are uh, in need. And so I just want to talk to you about the CPR course offering that we have for you all. Um, this course is about four hours long and it teaches critical skills needed to respond and manage an emergency um, until a higher level of care will get to you. So this is CPR and first aid course. So you'd be learning first aid, choking, stroke, adult and child CPR, and then how to use an automated external defibrillator. So an AED. Um, this is really helpful because it's a course that is for somebody with little or no medical training. And you get a lot of hands-on skills practice with mannequins and different, different simulations. And so you're able to really use those skills in an everyday setting instead of just when um, you're practicing. So you're able to actually use an AED. After this course, you will be certified in CPR for two years and you will just need to recertify every two years and you will have a skill set to perform CPR and be able to be prepared and ready when an emergency does happen. I hope that you take this course and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.